Well, hello, everybody. Good evening. Hiya, hiya. Welcome to the Wayne Theater. My name is Kim Ryder. I'm the uh, Director of Operations here at the Wayne Theater. And on behalf of our amazing ambassadors, our board of directors, and our amazing staff, we welcome you here tonight. Thank you so much for everybody being here. Uh, before we get going with the, with the wonderful program this evening, I just want to tell you a few things that are coming up here at the Wayne. Um, let's see, April 21st, that's a Friday night, just coming up next week, we have uh, Jonathan, or excuse me, uh, John McCutcheon. John McCutcheon is going to be in the house, that's right. Uh, the next weekend and the weekend after that, that we're going to have live on our stage, um, Little Shop of Horrors, guys. It's so, it's going to be great. It's going to be so much fun. They're rehearsing. We also have uh, Jonathan Blanchard, who has been here live on our stage a few times. He's going to be the voice of the plant, and he's got a really deep voice, and it's just, he's amazing. It's going to be really fun. Lots of talented actors as well as Jonathan uh, joining us for that, so that's great. Um, and also, later on in May, we have Andrew Duhon coming, and in June, we have our new gala, our Gala 2023, Rock the Block. So we close off the street right in front of the theater. We have band, amazing food, drinks. It's a wonderful night. Uh, tickets are going pretty quickly, and it did sell out last year, so if you're interested in coming back and joining us for that, we would love to have you join us. So without further ado, we're going to introduce... Mr. Tom Benzie. Thank you so much, Kim, and uh, I'll add my welcome to the Wayne Theater, um, and welcome to our grand finale for the season of our science talks. As you know, we've hosted these, uh, it's been six years now, believe it or not. We start them in September, and we continue through April, and then we take a break in the summer. I serve on the board for the Virginia Museum of Natural History. I'm also on the faculty at JMU, active with the Center for Cold Waters Restoration, and the themes for our talks are always local and regional science-based. And tonight's talk fits right into that realm. Uh, just a little bit of an update on, maybe some of you know that uh, we're also actively promoting the idea of a Waynesboro campus of the Virginia Museum of Natural History, which will be on the banks of the South River. Uh, you may have seen an article in today's paper, the front page of today's paper highlighted uh, the transfer of property that's going on between Waynesboro as a donation uh, on behalf of um, this project to the state. So that's a very exciting development. Uh, some of you know that we're in the middle of doing our exhibit design work. And if you want to learn more about that, we are hosting sessions on third Fridays every month. I've done several of those. This month, a colleague of mine, Len Poulin, on the foundation board for the museum will be hosting that at the uh, Waynesboro Public Library on Friday next week at uh, 4 to 5 p.m. for an hour. So if you have questions about that project, I encourage you to come to that. So tonight's speakers, we have two. Um, John Ross and Eric Hallerman are going to tag team on the topic that you see in front of you on South, uh, Southern Appalachian Brook Trout. Uh, John Ross is an author, uh, has written several books, my favorite being The 100 Best Trout Streams to Fish, um, and I'm, I'm, I'm retiring soon, so I'm going to look back on that list and make sure I, I'm, I'm making my way, my progress on that, on that list of 100 best trout streams. Um, Eric Hallerman is on the faculty at Virginia Tech in the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Department, a professor there, um, and has done a lot of genetics on brook trout, which you'll hear about tonight. Um, so I think, uh, please join me in welcoming first John and then Eric to the stage after John has an opportunity to present. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, I can't tell you how strange it feels to be here. So back in the dark ages, uh, I chaired the Virginia Council of Trout Unlimited. And uh, one of the questions that uh, everybody asked was, how did brook trout get in the mountains? And uh, we didn't have an answer. Uh, people told me that it must have been uh, osprey. Uh, that uh, in their poop dropped brook trout eggs. That's probably a little far-fetched. But, uh, but this whole thing, this whole saga of uh, brook trout and how uh, they got into the uh, southern Appalachians was really at the very core of the beginning 
of the uh, effort to create uh, a branch of the Virginia Museum of Natural History here in Waynesboro. And without uh, boring you of all the details, uh, uh, <coughs> Irby Nash, who's uh, sitting in uh, the audience, uh, and others had the idea of creating a uh, brook trout hatchery uh, on the Crompton plant uh, site uh, on the river because it had access of three million gallons of spring water a day. What a great place for a brook trout hatchery. And the idea was to raise southern strain brook trout to uh, repopulate uh, their native area, which is uh, the new watershed, new river watershed in south. And so while we were working on that project, uh, we also had the idea of creating a little interpretive center, you know, maybe a few uh, posters, uh, maybe a little exhibit that would help people better understand uh, the Blue Ridge Mountain uh, Shenandoah Valley uh, ecology. That idea uh, 20 years ago has morphed into the campaign that is going to bring a branch of the Virginia Museum of Natural History to downtown Waynesboro to be downtown, the uh, anchor, uh, economic anchor for the city. And uh, I couldn't be more uh, elated by the progress that Tom and other members of the museum board, uh, Len Poulin, have made to make all this happen because uh, this is really natural resource-based, environmental education-based economic redevelopment, and it couldn't be stronger. So uh, with that context in mind, let's talk about uh, brook trout, uh, Savalinus fontanalis. And if I get this thing right, so uh, brook trout are our uh, only native salmonid. Uh, and, and they are actually uh, a char as opposed to being uh, a trout. Uh, there's a, a little genetic uh, difference uh, and some physical differences uh, that Eric will explain. The, uh, they are a favorite sport fish. Uh, they are, brook trout are uh, the state fish of nine states uh, in the east and also in the upper Midwest. They're an indicator of environmental uh, quality. Uh, Back in the uh, uh, late 90s, uh, early 2000s, acid rain uh, was a huge issue. And the uh, Virginia Trout Stream Sensitivity Study uh, run by the University of Virginia uh, was actively involved in monitoring uh, water quality to uh, uh, see how the um, uh, acid rain uh, emissions from steam plants were affecting uh, trout streams, and brook trout were the uh, indicator species. Uh, the good news to report is that uh, that research helped uh, refine the Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, and uh, brook trout are returning to our mountain streams. Uh, <coughs> the distribution is the uh, culmination of a number of factors. Uh, one of the, uh, the two principal factors, one is climate change, which we'll get into, and the other is uh, the work of humans in terms of uh, development, agriculture, uh, city building, uh, and that sort of stuff. And um, <coughs> the, the key point of this is that uh, brook trout are uh, a threatened species and they've, um, their uh, viability is in our hands. So where did brook trout originate? Uh, first, uh, it, uh, it is uh, one of the earliest uh, indicators of native salmonids. They were, um, salmonids were uh, chars, um, uh, trout, grayling, whitefish. The, um, <coughs> this fossil uh, was uh, recovered in uh, British Columbia and it's about um, 50, 60 million years old. And so that's where the salmonid family uh, began. <coughs> and uh, they are really uh, part of uh, an entire species that uh, evolved into a number of different uh, of, uh, trout, uh, rainbow trout, cutthroat, uh, Chinook king salmon, coho, uh, sockeye, uh, shammer dog uh, salmon, uh, pink salmon, uh, brown trout, Atlantic salmon, lake trout, and brook trout. So uh, say again. <coughs> 
Somebody ask a question. Okay. Um, <coughs> Eric, you're on. Hi, thank you, John. Uh, good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to join you here tonight. Um, so, this is this is called a phylogram, and this recapitulates the uh, evolution of the chars. Um, this work was done by Le Caudet et al. 2018. It is our best understanding of the evolution of the lineage of the chars. What's interesting here is that there are 16 different species. Most of them occur in Eastern Asia. Only five of them occur in North America. Bull trout, brook trout, lake trout, dolly varden, and arctic char. Um, what I found surprising as we got into this line of review to create this talk is that the nearest relative of brook trout is not arctic char which is the one that resembles it the most physically and would make the most sense in a certain way because they overlap here in, the, in eastern North America. No, its nearest relative is lake trout, Savalinus namekush. Now, that raises an issue. Since all of these species, the center of diversity is in the northwestern part of North America, how then did this lineage get to eastern North America? All right, so um, John and I hypothesize that the Paleo Bell River, which is a river system that used to exist that no longer does. Here you can see where the rivers drain northward towards what's now Hudson Bay and into the Labrador Sea. This is not the way the drainage network looks today. Um, should this lineage have gotten into this part of North America, it then had access to all of Eastern North America. So, this movement to the east set the stage for the differentiation of brook trout and lake trout. It's clear that brook trout and lake trout descended from a common ancestral species somewhere between 15 and 10 million years ago. We know that from the phylogram that I showed you a moment ago. Now, John and I note that the split of these two species coincides very closely whoops, with the uplift of the Appalachians and the isolation of the Canadian Shield from the Mississippi River drainage. So this is a map of eastern North America about 50 million years ago. And you can see that as uplift occurred, that the Bell River became separated from the Mississippi drainage. The Bell River drained northward, and the Mississippi River drained southward, and that created ecological and genetic isolation between those lineages. We think then that lake trout that were in the northern part of the range up here, those that were separated in flat water developed the adaptations such as a forked tail that are very appropriate for them to have life in flat water, in non-flowing water. Um, so we then have to explain how they got from this uplift and the separation of these evolutionary lineages and explain how the current distributions of these species, of these species arose. Basically, how did brook trout come to colonize our modern river network? So we're going to focus in this talk because we're speaking to you today in the southern Appalachian mountains on southern Appalachian brook trout. All right, so we hypothesize that brook trout that are populating the Appalachians north and east of the New River colonized Virginia from the Atlantic Ocean, swimming up the Roanoke, James, Rappahannock, and Potomac Rivers to gain access to our fresh waters. Those that are in the New River watershed, remember the New comes and joins the Ohio and goes down into the Mississippi, they colonized it via the Ohio, the Kanawha, and then the New Rivers. And those in the Appalachians southwest of the New River migrated along the Atlantic around Florida in times when Earth's climate was cooler, entered the Mississippi, and then colonized the Tennessee, French Broad, Clinch, Powell, and Holston Rivers. Okay then, so the natural history of brook trout explains the geographical distribution of the species, and it also gives rise to the patterns of population genetic variation that I'll get into in just a moment. But I get a, a bit ahead of myself. I have to explain just a little bit more to explain the current distribution of the respective species. Um, 
Let's consider more recent episodes of natural history, especially over the last 18,000 years or so. All right, so looking back a bit further over the past 500,000 years, this plot here whoops, shows variation in Earth's mean temperature going back from today, going back half a million years. And you can see that the Earth has been through a number of different ice ages. Um, What's happened, these historical variations in temperature drove the onset and retreat of several different ice ages. This map here shows the extent of glacial ice 18,000 years ago. Where I grew up near Chicago, if I had stepped outside my home, I would have had a mile of ice towering above my head. That glacial front ranged through what's now Illinois, Ohio, and Indiana. Clearly, brook trout could not have inhabited this part of their range. In fact, they were pushed much further south because it was not only colder but much drier. What they had to do then, excuse me a minute, yeah. So the most recent glacial maximum was such that brook trout and many other animal and plant species had to migrate south and they had to hide in various places that we call refugia, plural of refuge, and we have a good sense where those refuges are. They were the same for brook trout as they were for many others. We have a Mississippian refuge. Here in North America, we're very lucky. Our rivers drain from north to south. Compare that to Europe, where the Alps are east-west, and the fish couldn't migrate across the Alps. They were simply extirpated. They also had a refuge area in the area surrounding the Chesapeake Bay. And because the coastal shelf was explained, they also had a refuge area up in the area that we call Acadia. Some of how we inferred that these particular species were in these refugia had to do with population genetics, as we'll see in just a moment. All right, so since 18,000 years ago, we've been in a period of uh, global temperature rise, and with the Holocene deglaciation, animals and plants that were in these different refuge areas were able to recolonize much of eastern North America. Um, at one point, brook trout had a much larger range than they have today because much of the southeast was available and appropriate for them. But as natural warming continued, um, they became extirpated because the summers in the southeast are just too warm for brook trout. And so their range contracted and they lost this much of their distribution. That gave rise to the distribution that we see today, the familiar distribution of brook trout. Collectively, these processes shape the deepest patterning of genetics that I'll explain as I get a little bit further into this talk. But before I get there, we've talked natural history. Now I have to talk about the unnatural history of brook trout. Well, over the past 400 years, European colonization of North America and the dramatic increase in the human population, over-exploitation of fishes including brook trout, alteration of habitat including the building of dams, agricultural uh, expansion, changing of forested land into grazing land, building of roads, often with perched culverts, introduction of rainbow trout and brown trout, which pushed the brook trout further up into the watershed. All of these particular anthropogenic actions fragmented brook trout habitat, led to loss of particular populations, and led to isolation of those populations in terms of demography. There's no migrants between them anymore, and they become isolated genetically. All of these things have consequences for modern brook trout. The distribution and genetic structure of brook trout then have been impacted by all of these natural and unnatural processes. What I'm showing here is a map that I borrowed from the Eastern Brook Trout Joint Venture. And the coloration of the map shows in green where populations persist and are healthy, in yellow where they're just hanging on, and in red where they are becoming lost, where they're threatened. Brook trout have already been extirpated from over a fifth of their historic range. And many local populations are now isolated. What happens then as they're isolated, a population genetic process called random genetic drift occurs. Because these populations are a finite size, they tend to lose genetic variation just by chance. Um, that is important to their future adaptivity. Uh, what happens then is the smaller populations have less capacity for adapting to changing circumstances which is a concern that I'll return to in a little bit. And then there's another issue. 
and that is that as populations of brook trout declined, we took it upon ourselves to stock them widely. Uh, widespread stocking began in the mid-1800s. Uh, brook trout of a rather few genetic origins were widely stocked. Much of these, many of these hatchery strains were from the Northeast, especially from Pennsylvania and New York. So this brings us then to my field, the field of population genetics. And much of what I'm about to share comes from that. Basically, population genetics is the study of variation within and between populations. I'm going to focus on that in the next couple of slides. Um, I'm going to try and keep it simple. What we're basically going to find is that genetic variation has geographic patterning. The deepest patterning comes from natural historical processes, from the processes of shrinking into glacial refugia and then ranging out of them, onto which more recent population genetic processes leave their imprint, mutation, migration from adjacent populations or from stocking, um, random genetic drift, and natural selection. And then lastly, humans have added their fingerprints on this by leading to the extirpation of populations and by stocking. So the point is that we can interpret the patterns that I'm about to explain, which gives us new and useful inform information, useful for conservation and for management. Well, are all the brook trout alike? Well, we've known for a long time that they're not. Uh, brook trout populations differ in terms of their life histories. We have migratory ones that are like salmon. They're born in fresh water, go out to sea as juveniles, return as subadults to spawn. Those guys are often called salters in the Northeast. Some are not. They're landlocked. They live their entire lives in fresh water. Brook trout in the South mature younger, most often at age two and at smaller size than brook trout further north which tend to mature at age three or four or five if you get far en farther en enough north. Um, and this variation also differs between coastal and inland uh, settings. Coastal trout are more often salters, inland ones are never salters. Um, one of the key studies was conducted in the Smokies in 1967 when Lennon noted that the fish that were in the Smokies did not look like the fish further north. They differ a little in morphology, they differ, they differ in their coloration pattern, and the life history traits that I just mentioned. Um, brook trout had been studied on a state-by-state -state basis for many years since then, for about 50 years by now, using a variety of different, what we call them genetic markers. It could be study of enzyme variation, we call it allozymes, study of mitochondrial DNA, study of microsatellite or other nuclear DNA markers, and they all tend to show that there is considerable variation of brook trout across a landscape. But until recently, no one had ever taken it upon themselves to do a study range-wide focusing on southern Appalachian brook trout. Well, what can range-wide studies tell us of southern Appalachian brook trout? Um, as John alluded, I was part of a large multi-investigator team that looked at this in a concentrated way for about 15 years. And this group of authors includes trout managers in all the southern states, plus about half a dozen geneticists, and we published our results in transactions to the American Fishery Society last year. I'm gonna go over this briefly. I realize this is not a genetics class. There will be no test at the end of the semester. You are not under any threat at all. The challenge to me is to explain it in simple English. All right, so basically what we did over collections over 15 years and by making many, many phone calls to colleagues as far north as Canada, was to obtain about 22,000 samples from 836 different populations across the native range, focusing on the southern part of the range, but going on up into Canada. Here I'm showing the new river watershed, which will come up again later. The squiggly blue line is the Eastern Continental Divide, which will come up in a couple of key contexts. We didn't want to sample small populations to death, and the way we sampled them was to have a fin clip, and then we released the fish alive to the water. All right, let me briefly introduce the molecular markers that we use. Scattered about the genome are tracts where there are tandem repeats, one after another, of simple DNA sequences. In this case, I'm showing CTT, CTT, CTT. And individuals may differ 
on each of their chromosomes in a pair how many of these repeats they have. And certainly individuals vary in how much of these repeats they have at that locus and across populations. So at this given place, one individual may have eight repeats, another may have seven, another may have nine. And we could score that in the lab. What we do is we use polymerase chain reaction. Do we know what polymerase chain reaction is? All right, so we can amplify up targeted sequences in the lab and then we can put them through a DNA sequencer. And this is what our raw data look like. And we can measure the molecular weight of these peaks and that tells us how many of these repeats we have. And it's very boring data to tell you nothing in and of itself, but when you apply statistics to it, you start seeing the picture that the puzzle presents. These brook trout were typed at 12 microsatellite loci. The work was done at the U.S. Geological Survey Leetown Science Center in Carnesville, West Virginia. And I love the statistics, but I'll spare you. You're welcome. All right, so let's start with variation within populations. What I'm showing here is kind of hard to see, but this pie diagram showing how many different alleles, how many variants there are at a particular place in the genome. And here I'm showing pie diagrams that show the likelihood that individuals differ within themselves, that the chromosome you got from your father has a different number of repeats than the one you got from your mother. They're both metrics of population genetic variation. What we found is that in southern Appalachian brook trout, within population genetic diversity is in the low to moderate range for fishes. What was interesting to us is that it's lower in the southern Appalachian mountains than it is in the northern Appalachian mountains. Well, why might that be so? Well, what we found, and we can estimate the genetic sizes of populations, and that the genetic, the, uh, the, popu the effective population sizes of populations in the south were often less than 30. That's small enough that this process called random genetic drift is strong enough that populations tend to lose variation. That's a concern to a conservation geneticist, and I'll return to that in a little bit. All right, among population genetic diversity, um, brook trout populations across the southern Appalachians exhibit, exhibited marked differentiation from one another. What was interesting to me is that a lot of it, 57% of it, was among drainages, 13% at finer scales even within drainages. Take my word for it, that's a lot compared to most other fishes that I've worked at. I've worked in population genetics of fishes for about 35 years. Um, the structuring was sufficiently strong that if you were to walk up to me, as this gentleman seems to be doing, and present me a trout, don't tell me where it is. I could look at its DNA, and I could tell you with 87% confidence which collection it came from among those 800 populations. I could tell you with almost 95% certainty which eastern brook trout joint venture patch it came from. And if you let me have a whole watershed, I have a 98.5% chance of getting it right. That genetic differentiation is so strong that it was really striking. Well, the question then is, how does this genetic variation map out spatially? And this is where some of the stories that I was talking about in terms of uh, natural historical processes and population genetics really start becoming important. All right, so we mapped out this genetic variation and we used a statistical test called DAPSI, Discriminant Analysis of Principal Components. What you're basically doing is you're telling the computer, I want you to divide this genetic variation into two piles and then tell me how it's distributed across the landscape. And so what we see here is at k equals 2, we have all of these little dots, these pink dots in the northern part of the range, and all these blue dots in the southern part of the range. Lo and behold, nor northern and southern Appalachian brook trout are distinct. Starting with Lennon in 1967, just looking at the trout, how do they look, he was on to something. And all the studies that were done since then tended to reinforce it. Using modern methods, we could show it even more. What was interesting, though, is that we could show that there are instances in the south where the stocking of these northern brook trout had impacts on the receiving populations. The other thing that was striking is that some of this southern heritage is distributed further north than the New River, going up into contributing to pie diagrams as far north as Pennsylvania. So that changed our view. It's not just southern and northern brook trout, it's more like east of the Continental Divide and west of the Continental Divide which has to do with where they hid from the glaciers 18,000 years ago. We then told the computer, divide it into three piles. 
And what did we find? These green ones relate to the northern glacial refuge, so we call them Acadian brook trout. The central part of the range related to the refuge in the Chesapeake Bay. We call them mid-Atlantic brook trout. And the southern lineage, we call them southern Appalachian brook trout. And that responds to the Missis that is uh, the consequence of the Mississippian glacial refuge. All right, now, you can add more and more levels of K, and we went up to 25. I won't show you all of them. But basically what happens is at higher K, you start, oops, you start breaking off smaller clusters of population. So at K equals 5, what breaks out? The Shenandoah National Park populations. Why? This is the most stocked population of brook trout on the planet. Whenever people wanted more trout, the park managers put in more trout. They got on the telephone, whatever they could find, they put in the water. So this is the most mixed brook trout population on the planet. Then we start breaking off the Pigeon River. And then as you add more levels of K, especially across North Carolina, each of these watersheds has its unique population. Okay. So let's start backing up a little bit and looking at the highest level of what we can tell. Despite extensive stocking, many brook trout populations in the southern Appalachian Mountains do not show evidence of introgression, of interbreeding with hatchery brook trout. The vast majority of southern Appalachian populations still retain the, their genetic character that we believe to be aboriginal, that was there from nature. Now, a small number of populations do look like hatchery populations. They reflect either the interbreeding with the hatchery strains or the replacement with hatchery strains. Um, the small effective population sizes of many of these southern populations, often on the order of magnitude of about 30, suggest that these populations are subject to considerable random genetic drift, and they may be losing genetic variation, which would be important for them to persist over the short term and to adapt over the long term. And interestingly and very hearteningly for us, we did not see evidence of inbreeding depression in these brook trout populations. Well, let's talk now about variation between the populations. Past authors, you know, including myself, whoops, did I skip to? Here we go. Ah, oh, here we go. There are high levels of genetic divergence among populations across the native range, but even greater across much of the southern Appalachians. Well, why might that be? Well, it might be because of random processes or selective processes. Non-selective forces, well, these brook trout were not displaced by glaciations, and so they've had longer for uh, random genetic drift to just simply allow these populations to randomly deviate from one another. Um, further, populations at the southern end, end, end of their range are more likely to experience population bottlenecks because it gets warm and not enough of them can survive a particular selective challenge such that they're more subject to genetic drift just anyway. Um, a natural selection. Southern populations have been on the landscape for a longer time and they've had a longer time to adapt to, adapt to their local watersheds and that leads to the evolution of the higher temperature tolerance, um, smaller size and age of maturity and the shorter longevity that we see in southern brook trout. Okay, now past authors, including myself, have considered southern Appalachian brook trout a distinct southern strain. But on the strength of our findings, we suggest that we have to reconsider all of this. Um, population genetic variation is more complex than a northern versus southern dichotomy. Rather, this occurs at a broad scale, and what we used to consider southern ancestry extend, extends on up into Pennsylvania. Really, we should start considering interior versus coastal variation. Um, the other thing is that I had even written myself about how everything from the New River and Southwest, that that was the dividing line, um, it's not that simple. What's happening is that the brook trout from these different glacial refugia, as they recolonize the landscape, even blended together, and so it's a mixing of ancestries that we had not recognized till now. All right. So, I'm a professor in the Department of Fisheries Conservation. It would be reasonable for you guys to ask me, well, Eric, why would we care? Well, this informs our decision making for stewardship of brook trout. Brook trout is, of course, an important managed species. What are our goals for management of brook trout? 
but basically we're looking to maintain their viability over the short term, meaning basically over one human lifetime. And we're also looking to maintain their long-term adaptive potential, especially in the face of ongoing anthropogenic impacts, including climate change, say over the next 500 years. And so how would this inform management of brook trout? In fact, I've spoken to trout managers from the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources. And what we did is when we looked at the distribution of the genetic variation, for instance, at a DAPSI of 10, what we see is that each watershed basically has its own color of pie diagrams here. Basically, what that tells us is that watershed level variation is what's important. So the units, our spatial units of, man of management are watersheds. The managers always ask me, how far can I move trout? Moving trout from a demographically viable population to a demographically challenged population, you can move them within watersheds. What hatchery stocks can we use? Use local stocks if possible. The upshot of that is that we can't just turn to the Fish and Wildlife Service all the time and ask them for more brook trout that originally are derived from New York or Pennsylvania. What we really have to do is develop regionally appropriate strains. Uh, that will take time and money and an investment in resources like hatcheries. Um, there's some encouraging work along those lines. There's a teleco strain of brook trout that's becoming widely used in North Carolina and Tennessee. But we need a lot more work like that. Uh, perhaps if the Center for Cold Water Restoration really gets up and moving here in Waynesboro, that could be the Center for Propagation of Shenandoah Valley brook trout. Okay. Um, I now turn over the podium back to my friend John, who will conclude it. Thanks, Jerry. That was terrific. So I got to tell you about my uh, <clears throat> encounter with uh, brook trout. I uh, grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee, and um, and when I started trout fishing. I hope you all will forgive me. I was a hardware hurler. I fished with little spinners and little plugs. And I caught rainbow trout and brown trout. I fished the little Tennessee River before they built that damn dam. You know, and the, the, the brown trout were just phenomenal. But uh, when I moved to uh, Virginia from Winona, Minnesota, we've got great brook trout out there too, but really better brown trout. Uh, the closest trout stream where I could go hide from the telephone was the Rapidan. And the Rapidan uh, is part of, I guess it's the Rappahannock uh, River system. And so uh, it's the Mid-Atlantic uh, refuge. And uh, I didn't know that. Uh, what I knew was uh, you could stand at the base of this pool and you could watch the trout swim. And you could throw, uh, my typical uh, fly fishing rig was um, a, um, <clears throat> a dry fly and then hanging down beneath, beneath the dry fly was a little nymph that was, so I had a dry on top of the water and a little nymph down below the water. And you know, you saw that trout over there and if you made the right cast, the trout would take it and you could release it. But you had to take your time. And while you were standing there, you got a chance to admire the lady slippers up there on the bank that were blooming. And then over there, uh, the mink came out and sat on the rock. And there was a day when I was fishing the lower section of the Rapidan, when I uh, <coughs> was going up to fish uh, a pool that I knew uh, always held good trout. The red raspberries were ripe. And so you stroke these raspberry bushes kind of with a similar you know, motion like you might be milk on a cat. And you got a handful of red raspberries. What could be better than walking up to fish for brook trout, nibbling on uh, wild red raspberries? And in that particular pool, I used my uh, typical dry dropper rig and made a cast and boom, one trout took the dry fly and another trout took the little wet fly. And so I had two trout on the same line. Well, <coughs> Larry Moan and Gary Martell and others with uh, what was then uh, Virginia uh, Game and in Inland Fisheries uh, told me about uh, the stocking of, of um, 
the Rapidan after uh, that became a Shenandoah National Park stream, and that these were uh, called then Southern Appalachian Stream Brook Trout. And we were thinking a lot about uh, how we were going to uh, restore uh, brook trout and uh, thinking about uh, a hatchery and Trotta Limited uh, in its infinite wisdom said, well, you can't raise Southern Appalachian Stream brook trout in a hatchery because they're scared of people. Uh, well, that was interesting. But then it turned out that there were some records that uh, uh, Game and Fish had that showed that uh, these fish came from the Irwin, Tennessee hatchery and were then considered to be southern strain brook trout. And this was well above what uh, was then considered to be the dividing line between northern and southern strain brook trout. And so uh, some of us wondered, what was it that we knew back in the 1930s when these trout were stocked that we've conveniently forgotten now? So uh, there's an awful lot of work that uh, is being done now, particularly with the Tennessee Aquarium down in Chattanooga to uh, develop uh, southern or to develop brook trout that are suitable for uh, southern Appalachian uh, waters. And there's a, uh, there's a really interesting hatchery uh, in Knoxville called Conservation Fisheries. They don't do work with uh, brook trout, but what they do do is they work with endangered uh, dace and darters, uh, little minnows uh, in warm water streams. And they have these fascinating little environments that are not much bigger than uh, a tub. Uh, uh, the water comes in on the side. They put down uh, rocks and gravels that uh, mirror this, uh, the environment where they're gonna be placed. They, uh, they feed food from underneath. Uh, they control water uh, quality, chemistry, temperature, uh, velocity to match the environment where they're going to be put. And they also uh, control the lighting in the hatchery room so it mirrors a normal uh, diurnal cycle, day and nighttime cycle. So we thought, boy, this would be really interesting to use to develop for brook trout hatchery uh, here as part of the Center for Cold Water's restoration uh, efforts. Uh, it, it can be done. Going back uh, to uh, the slide that talked about the differentiation between um, brook trout and lake trout occurring during the Miocene uh, 15 to 10 million years ago, that was a period of geologic uplift. And uh, think about the Earth's crust as not being solid, but being plastic, rising and falling and rising and falling. It gets pushed up, gets eroded down, pushed up and eroded down. So that period uh, actually coincides with the uh, latest research about the age of the Great Smokies in the Southern Appalachians. People say, well, those are the oldest mountains in the world. I wouldn't take that to the bank. Uh, actually, instead of being uh, 260 to 300 million years old, uh, while some of the core rocks are that old, the peaks we see today are remnants of uh, mountains that were pushed up 15 to 20 million years ago. And it was that uplift uh, that occurred uh, not only in the Canadian Shield, but in the mountains we see uh, every day around here that caused the uh, separation of lake trout and uh, brook trout. So uh, moving on, uh, the, anthrop the Anthropocene is our era. It's the uh, era of people and the impact of uh, humans on uh, populations. And uh, we've talked about uh, uh, the glacial ages. Uh, each pulse of continental glaciation uh, drove uh, brook trout uh, further south. And then when uh, the uh, water temperatures warm, brook trout swam further upstream. And we uh, think that uh, those pulses of climate change really were what moved uh, the um, Mississippian population of uh, brook trout from uh, the Gulf of Mexico, which was as cold as the Arctic Ocean, up the Mississippi, up the Ohio, up the Tennessee, up the Kanawha, uh, into uh, the Southern Appalachian streams. So as um, temperatures continue uh, to rise, you can see uh, what happens to brook trout. Uh, 
they will be uh, extirpated. Uh, they'll go away. So if, um, we've had, uh, you know, I was amazed uh, in our research to find uh, information about uh, the Paleo Belve watershed. Uh, you remember that uh, picture, that map that had uh, the arms of the watershed uh, touching northernmost uh, British Columbia and uh, the edges of um, the Grand Canyon. That was a watershed that it was as big as the Amazon, uh, an absolutely phenomenal uh, watershed. So if, um, the, if, uh, the question is if, uh, climate change and human development are the biggest threats to uh, brook trout. The, uh, the thing that, uh, that uh, is important to keep in mind that today, native brook trout are found largely uh, at elevations above 3,000 feet in the mountains. These are small mountain streams. And I'm, I know all of you have uh, driven uh, through the mountains and you've seen uh, what the uh, Volia Delgad uh, have done to the Hemlocks, and so uh, many of our favorite mountain streams are no longer shaded uh, as they once were. Uh, and so uh, those streams are subject to uh, warming. The uh, stocking of rainbow and brown trout has really uh, taken habitat away from brook trout. And uh, human ac uh, activity, particularly agriculture, but also uh, the development of, of highways, railroads, uh, cities, parking lots, really have removed an awful lot of brook trout habitat. Uh, Larry Moan, who used to be a uh, cold water fisheries biologist for uh, Division of Wildlife Resources, uh, tells a story of a four pound brook trout that was caught in uh, Mossy Creek back in uh, the, the 1980s, late 80s. Now, whether or not that was a native fish or a stock fish, uh, nobody knows. But those spring creeks once held, all the spring creeks in the valley, once held big trout. Uh, agriculture, uh, the uh, lack of shade, uh, cattle in the creek, uh, no more. Uh, brook trout are now pretty much restricted to those high mountain streams. So I want to leave you with this thought. As climate continues to warm, how much further upstream can brook trout swim? Thank you all very much. Uh, questions? Thank you, John and Eric. And uh, yes, we do have some time for questions. Since we do have this live streamed, if you'll wait for the microphone to come over you so, so that you can uh, broadcast your question to the live stream as well, appreciate it. So are there questions? There are no questions. I will administer an exam after this <laughs> class. <laughs> he has questions for I, you. I threaten my Actually, undergrads with that all the time. One question that I had for you, Eric, was you, you talked about effective population size. I think you said something about 30. Is that, it, would we understand that to be there 30 individuals in that population that are right. reproducing, something like that? Or? All right, so effective population size is a fairly subtle concept, but it has to do with how many fish are actually reproducing the sex ratios, the relative success of different spawning pairs, and then whether there has been a genetic bottleneck of recent generations. So 30 is small. That's why we were worried about inbreeding. We did not see any notable impact of inbreeding other than a few populations here or there. What you want is for your effective population size to be in the hundreds because that means you have plenty of genetic variation to respond to the selective challenges that those populations will inevitably face going through time. These are smaller populations that a conservation genesis feels comfortable with. Right. There's some questions. We'll start here. Yeah, just go ahead. Yeah. So speaking more, speaking more locally, um, the river that comes through Waynesboro, what's in that, or what's up in the parkway, up in the, the uh, streams around here in this area? Tom, why don't you answer that question? <laughs> so the South River, um, you know, drains into the Potomac watershed. So we would be part of that mid-Atlantic refuge. And our streams that feed into the South River come from 
the western slope of the Blue Ridge. So there's a number of small spring creeks and uh, uh, freestone streams that feed in off of the big levels. If anybody's ever been to like um, the Coal Road, Charando Lake area, a lot of those cold waters come into the headwaters of the South River. And then as the South River goes through Waynesboro and on down towards Grottoes, it picks up a number of other streams off of the park. So the park streams drain also off the western slope of the Blue Ridge and feed into the South River. Now historically, I would like to think and imagine that those populations were connected through the South River. Yeah. Um, and certainly during climates that were colder, like you said, those fish would be pushed further down river and could take, take advantage of even further down into the Potomac, I assume. Sure, what I would expect is that local streams would have the character of the Shenandoah River, which would be very similar to others in the Potomac watershed, but with all the stocking that's gone on in the park, that fingerprint is still on those populations. That will never really disappear. Now, is that necessarily a terrible thing? Well, natural selection will sort that one out for us. There's another thing to keep in mind, too, when uh, thinking about glaciation. Now, your mic. we all talk about uh, glaciation uh, stopping in Pennsylvania and uh, New Jersey, but in fact, um, most of these mountains uh, wore at least semi-permanent and maybe permanent uh, caps of ice and snow. And you can, uh, when you drive some of, up some of these creeks, uh, you'll see boulders that are the size of, half the size of uh, small cars. Some of them are the size of a Morris Mini. So I want you to, th when you see a boulder of that size with all those rounded edges, I want you to think about the power of the meltwater that came from those mountain ice caps that rolled those boulders downstream. And also, if I think about uh, the, the velocity of that water and where trout had to be to survive that kind of an environment. Okay, so you were mentioning the, I, I, sorry if I'm not using the right language, but the sort of breeding population of 30, roughly, and wanting to get into the hundreds. So to get there, is it, is it a question of needing to have a kind of larger space in which to have more, or do you need to sort of have fewer fish removed so that the populations can get larger in the space or they can't do it because it's not big enough. So anyway, if you can just elaborate on sure, how sure. to get to the hundreds. This is a classical kind of a question that the managers ask me all the time. So basically what I would say is your management unit is a watershed. So in this case it would be, say, the Shenandoah. What you might want to do is have what we call assisted migration. You have a few breeders between populations in order to bring in new genetic variation to reverse any inbreeding that's ongoing, and to link all of these single populations into what we call a meta population, such that that meta population would have an effective size of, say, 500. In other words, we want to have basically one huge population in, say, the Shenandoah. And that's what we're working towards. I'd also like to say that we really should put a lot of effort into habitat so that the trout do it themselves. I'm 68 years old. I don't live in Oz. I realize what's likely. So uh, it's going to be humans moving fish for a time. But I'd really like to see within my own lifetime much more thoughtful use of hatchery fish and much more thoughtful use of assisted migration. I think it's just at our, gra at our reach that we can grasp and do that. And managers now are starting to talk about it. When I was a young professor in my 30s, the managers didn't want to hear from me. Now that we have data, and now that genetics has become part of a curricula in major fisheries programs, talks like mine are understood now. And so these kinds of more progressive management programs are done. Virginia's not leading the way. It's the western states. We're coming along. We'll get there. Is there any sign of adaptability to warmer or colder climates by these and other fish? In other fishes, there's plenty. Um, Adaptation to low temperature, think about it, the brook trout are already ex exposed to water at the freezing point. They're not gonna, that's not going to change very much. How far can they adapt to warming water? That's a good question. Rainbow trout, they have shown the ability, you know, they show heritability for heightened upper thermal tolerance. In other words, they can adapt to higher temperatures. A lot of that depends on chance. What genetic variants are already in your population? 
How large is your populate? How much genetic variation is there? What I'm concerned is that the level of warming that we're going to experience probably in the lives of our children and grandchildren will be more than the brook trout can handle. So we can talk about shading, we can talk about a number of things, we can talk about how trout will hold out in some areas where the groundwater is good and cold. But those charts that we showed at the very end that are mostly blue make my stomach go, oh, I'd hate to have my grandchildren live in a world without native brook trout. Well, and I have to tell you that uh, when I caught uh, my first uh, native brook trout uh, in the headwaters of the uh, Rapidan, I looked at that little fish and that struck me as being the beautiful wildflower of our mountain streams. They are just, there is no trout like them. Maybe that's a great place to leave it tonight. Um, certainly, once again, want to thank John and Eric for sharing this most interesting recent work. Also, once again, if uh, do, you do have ideas for science talks, we are planning our next series next year, and so we'd be happy to entertain those. You can either speak with myself or some of my, my other colleagues in the Center for Cold Waters Restoration. Uh, we'll see you in September. <laughs>